Okay, I um, think I'm good to start if everyone else tells me that I am. Um, I'm not sure how many people are on at the moment, but welcome to our symposium today. I hope that everyone is going to enjoy it. Um, my name is Anushka Astana. I'm editor at large at The Guardian and I present our daily podcast. I also have another role at ITV for which I have just started using these rapid COVID tests, which is of course what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, many of the people you're going to hear from think that these little things could be a game changer and absolutely crucial in helping us manage pandemics. There are others who question their accuracy and say negative tests will give people a false sense of security. They also ask whether everyone is ready to embrace another system at such a huge cost after failures that we've seen, for example, in test and trace. We're going to hear responses to that critique again from global experts who think that this little thing, mass asymptomatic testing, is our key to reopening society, which is, of course, what we all um, want. Let me tell you who you're going to be hearing for. So we've got Professor Irina Peterson from UCL, who has been absolutely instrumental in setting up this event, and we'll start after I finished with an introduction to what we're hearing about. Um, we're also gonna have Michael Minna, Associate Professor at the Harvard School of Public Health, who has published several papers on rapid tests. Then Oxford Professor Tim Pito, Liverpool University Professor Ian Buchan, who led the widely publicized national pilot, Dr. Eric Kucher from the New York University School of Medicine, and then Ryan Wayne, who's strategic advisor at the Tony Blair Global Institute for Change. They're all going to be talking about different opportunities and challenges. Um, I think we've got quite a lot of people watching, so please do submit any questions for discussion via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We obviously won't be able to answer everyone, but I'll try to make sure that a good number get answered as we go along and certainly at the end we're going to hear each of our speakers first. Now if you want to come back to any of the slides that you see in the event the whole thing is being recorded as I think you may maybe just heard and they'll all be available to view afterwards. So look I'm going to just start off by showing you one of these tests in case you haven't come across them because many many people are starting to use them now including for the school comeback. So here we go this is what it, it involves. Um, I didn't want to do the entire test on here because I didn't think you wanted to see me shove this up my nose. So I have just done that before we went <laughs> live and got it ready. And you simply put this up your nose, swab, you put it into this little tube here, and then you have what looks like a little pregnancy test into which hopefully I haven't made any mistakes. And in about 15 minutes, we will know when I put three drops in there, I think I'm gonna to be told if I've got any of this wrong, um, whether or not I have well, actually, I, I don't know, I might be have to be careful with the language here, but whether or not this is positive and I need to go and get another test to confirm it. So listen, I'm going to wait for those results. And in the meantime, let me introduce Irina Peterson. Hi, um, I'm going to start today uh, and I'm delighted to see so many people who have uh, signed up uh, for this uh, symposium today to talk about can we test ourselves out of the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, it's nearly a year now since the World Health Organization declared an out, uh, the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are now a, a year on and we are still in the midst of it. Um, so today I took a, a screenshot of uh, different uh, countries to look at how many have died in the last year from uh, COVID-19. And as you can see, uh, we have had uh, two waves in many countries. The number of people who have died varied a lot from country to country, but the shapes are pretty similar uh, in many different countries. 
However, you do have some tools to try to reduce the transmission. Uh, so we have uh, implemented in the last year face mask, social distancing, uh, some ventilation. We now have vaccines and we also have uh, test and isolate. Uh, but often that has not been enough and we have needed to uh, move further uh, in terms of producing human activities and contacts. And in many countries across the world, we have needed to close shops and restaurants, schools and workplaces, and many countries have also ended up introducing lockdown as a very last measure to get uh, the pandemic under control. Uh, and we do know that most of these tools work, but they also have some major impact on our life. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who is thinking when and how will we be able to return to some sort of normal life again. I mean, I've just taken a few pictures here to illustrate what life did look like a little bit more than a, a year ago. And I hope, I think many of us are hoping that we will at some point be able to return to that life again. And one good news is that we have the vaccines and we do know that they now reduce death and hospital, hospitalization. Uh, so here is a tweet um, from one of the journalists from the uh, Financial Times, and he has been able to uh, demonstrate that those who have been vaccinated, that the rate of uh, hospitalization and death is declining fast in these groups in UK. And there are also some evidence that the vaccine reduced transmission. But there's still a long way to go before all adults are vaccinated. And also we do see new variants uh, cropping up uh, in different places. And we know that with every new COVID case, there is a risk of new variants uh, that may uh, eventually compromise the vaccine. So we really have a, a strong need to keep the number of COVID infections at a minimum. And this is where one of the new tools in the toolbox, the rapid testing is coming in. And rapid testing is a new way of thinking. It's not like the uh, testing that we have been used to. Uh, it is a screening tool and it focuses on testing people without symptoms uh, or without any of the core symptoms. And the key uh, role for the rapid testing is to identify infectious people, so to do it quick, cheap, and to repeat. Um, and it may turn out to become one of the most important tools in terms of reducing transmission of COVID-19. It will help us to open societies, and it may also bring uh, the pandemic under control. So in many ways, I think if you can imagine that all our friends, our families, are, oh, come on, let's try again. Um, if we can imagine that all our friends, our families and colleagues are tested on a regular basis, then there won't be many places for the coronavirus to hide. That is the basic principle of uh, mass testing. Of course, this sounds very uh, glamorous and uh, it may not be as straightforward. Uh, and this is also why we have the symposium today is to discuss both the challenges and the limitations of mass testing. And that is what I would like to say to start with. And then I'm delighted to uh, welcome all our speakers today. Thank you very much, Irina. And that's right, we're going to now go through each of our experts and you're going to hear from them. Um, I can see there's already questions coming in, so I will keep an eye on them. And if it works, I'll put some to you in between, particularly if there are specific questions for you. Um, and 
afterwards we'll certainly have a Q&A session. So far, still waiting for my result, but apparently, I think this line means I did it correctly. Is that right? Hopefully, I've made no mistakes. So, so far, I'm just waiting for that COVID results. And in the meantime, I'm going to introduce Michael Mina from Harvard, who has published a number of papers on this, as I mentioned, and is going to be talking about using mass testing as an exit strategy for the COVID-19 pandemic. Michael. Hey, well, thank you. Um, thanks, everyone uh, out there for joining. Um, so I want to talk uh, a bit about uh, how we can use testing uh, specifically, of course, for public health, which is really uh, what we're talking about here. And, um, and uh, I want to start with this. A lot of people ask, do we actually still need testing in this pandemic? Um, uh, why, why are we even having this discussion, et cetera? Um, you know, I really, uh, I really like this uh, paper and this uh, this particular um, figure of coronavirus seasonality. I think that this is essential. It was essential for us to look at uh, earlier uh, last year in, in March and April, May and June. Uh, we we knew uh, we had so much information in front of us to tell us that cases were going to skyrocket in the fall. Uh, all I've done here on the right side, it's it's not exactly scientific. I've just overlaid. Uh, the 10 year uh, average from this particular paper uh, for beta coronavirus is over the New York Times data for the United States. Uh, just to show that, uh, you know, there's a very good chance that cases they, uh, we've, we've seen declines, we're not seeing plateaus, and uh, we very well will uh, continue to see uh, outbreaks. I, I will not be surprised one bit if we see massive surges again in the fall. Uh, even in the context of vaccines. There are a lot of unknowns, but uh, I think that it's safe to say that this pandemic is not at its close. Um, and to think, other, to, to think otherwise would really be um, probably short-sighted of us. Uh, we're, a lot of people on this uh, meeting are talking about antigen tests. I wanna be very, very clear because there's actually been a lot of confusion in the media and even by scientists, uh, antigen tests are not antibody tests. Uh, these are two very different tests. Um, the antigen test or the molecular RNA test, these detect the virus when people are actually infected. The antibody tests detect IgG and IgM and, and using usually ELISA's and other similar technologies. Uh, usually one to two weeks after somebody is infected will those start to actually appear. Um, but when we say antigen, we're talking about the virus not the antibody, just to, just to make sure that that's very clear. So almost all of our discussion about testing traditionally is around diagnostic medical testing. All of our regulation, particularly here where I am in the United States is around medical testing. Uh, the discussion is, and unfortunately what that means is that almost all of the metrics that we've ever created in history about how to think about testing has largely been focused on a one-time test that a doctor gives to a person. Sensitivity and specificity is almost always considered in the context of one test. But what about serial testing? Uh, there is a whole world of testing, which for a pandemic like the one that we're in, I argue is much more important for public health than diagnostic medicine testing. And this is things like surveillance. Of course, we, we need surveillance testing during a pandemic, and that might be everything from wastewater, uh, PCR, to just testing asymptomatics to understand attributes of the virus, to understand if the virus is going up or going down, et cetera. And then there's a different type of population health testing, which is screening to actually try to limit spread, not just to give public health officials information about what's happening, but to actually start uh, becoming an intervention. To, uh, to make sure that on the other side of a doorway, for example, going into a school, uh, that it is a safer environment than it otherwise would be if there was no testing at that doorway. Or in the case of public health testing, which uh, I'll discuss a little bit about, uh, to actually try to test enough people frequently enough that you can actually bring the R value, the reproductive rate of the virus down below one uh, as vaccines are scaling up, uh, or in many places of the world where vaccines don't yet exist, we can actually start to bring uh, R below one and, uh, and, and actually start to beat down outbreaks just through testing enough people and empowering people to know 
their status. So while all of our efforts, all of the discussion, all of the metrics, all of the papers have largely focused on diagnostic metrics, uh, we are completely missing uh, this entire uh, approach to tackling a pandemic, which is population health testing. And that's what this meeting is about and um, in, in, in many ways. And, uh, and I think it's important to make these distinctions. And I hope one day our regulatory landscapes and scientists will catch up that there are multiple uh, avenues. And so not to beat a dead horse, but uh, medical use uh, is how we normally consider test characteristics and sensitivity in the case of this pandemic has been first and foremost, as well, of course, as specificity. Uh, but sensitivity, uh, we've, we've heard a lot about how rapid tests are low sensitivity and there's a lot of concern. And there's been almost no discussion uh, by our, certainly it doesn't enter into the regulatory landscape on cost or frequency of testing or the speed to get results. But I, I'm gonna show you over the next few slides that these two metrics uh, far outweigh sensitivity metrics. If you're not testing, uh, if, you're, if people aren't getting the tests, through making testing frequent and accessible and equitable. And if the testing is not very fast, then the testing isn't working to stop transmission. Might be working to diagnose somebody, but it is not working to stop transmission. Uh, but unfortunately, frequency, accessibility, equitability, speed have no place in our regulatory landscape for testing. And you almost never see it discussed when people go and evaluate a test program or evaluate a test because it's very hard to evaluate it. It's much easier to pick up a bunch of rapid tests and just ask the question, is it detecting somebody with a PCR CT value of 35? That is a, that's a, a, an easy way to do, to, to, to get a scientific paper, but it is missing the forest for the trees. And I think that it's extremely important to understand what our goals are. And our goals here are not to diagnose uh, people one at a time. Our goals are to stop transmission during a pandemic. Uh, and frequent, accessible, fast testing is where our priority should be. Uh, and I'll describe why analytical sensitivity is much less important. Uh, to understand this, the transmission window for this virus is very, very short. People remain PCR positive for 20 to 30 days, but the window of transmissibility is short. We know that the CDC, for example, recommends, a ten, you know, most places in the world recommend a 10 day isolation the CDC overtly recommends not to get tested uh, uh, after isolation because there's a recognition that people remain positive on a PCR test. So the window of transmissibility is very short. So if you're not testing frequently, you're just not going to find people when they're transmitting. And if the results take days to return, you're not, even if you catch somebody in the middle of their infectious window, you're going to get that result afterwards. And so uh, on the other hand, the, the viral RNA uh, uh, will last a long time. And this has been what has been obscuring every regulatory agency and many, many scientists' papers, including from our own CDC over and over and over again, is this dichotomy between the duration that somebody's RNA positive versus the duration that people are actually infectious. And so a way to actually identify people in the infectious window is to increase the frequency and increase the speed of testing. These are, uh, and so while most of our testing is focused on getting tests into the PCR laboratory, uh, that slows things down and it decreases access. It's very difficult to have massive programs of testing that go to laboratories. Uh, and so what we really need are to bring testing to the people, to bring results to the people and ideally, I think bring testing into the home, make it extremely accessible, extremely simple. And that's where rapid uh, tests like these come in. These are paper strip tests like you just uh, saw, uh, and they can give results in minutes that can be performed with 30 seconds of hands-on time. Uh, and they get easier and easier to use after you've used it once, uh, then they get better and better. And that's another piece of, of understanding public health testing. Uh, a lot of our usability studies give people one shot at testing and you ask how good is somebody's ability to use the test on the first try. But if a public health test is having people repeatedly use the test, we should be asking the question, how good is people's ability to use the test after the third try or the, you know, to, to, to give them opportunity to learn. Uh, but these are the types of tests that I think can really make a major difference. 
So don't rapid tests only have a 30 to 60% sensitivity in asymptomatics? This one question has been what has slowed down all of the rapid testing programs across the world, including at the FDA. This is why we don't have tests, uh, these tests in wide use in the United States. And it's what has created a tremendous amount of controversy in the UK and across the world around these tests. How can we reconcile that a test, that a rapid test only has 30 to 60% sensitivity in asymptomatics and then go and suggest that it's useful in schools? In the next slide, I'm going to show that this is the expectation for a test that is 100% sensitive during the infectious window. In fact, during a broader version, during 10 days of time, if you have a test that is specific, that is going to be a positive for 100% of the time that somebody is infectious and then turns off after the infectious window, but then you have additional time when somebody's PCR positive, when you're testing that kind of test in asymptomatics, where you're kind of throwing darts, you don't know where people are in the course of their infection, it's going to show a 30 to 60% sensitivity against PCR. And so we can make a simple mathematical model to understand this. And this is uh, in a, a paper in prep from, from my laboratory. But this is just using the most basic uh, conceptual design to understand this. If you have a test that is 100% sensitive in the first 10 days of an infection, when, which is when we expect people to have to isolate, and then we tell them not to, to test again after that isolation period. But we know that people then stay positive on PCR for an additional five or 10 or even 15 days. What you can see on the bottom curves here is the a priori expectation for the positive uh, uh, percent agreement with PCR. So this is showing that we expect if people are staying, if people are infectious for 10 days and you have a test that catches everyone during those 10 days, but then they're PCR positive for an additional 10 days, you can watch that as the, as the epidemic progresses, the, the expected sensitivity of that test is going to shift from around 60% at maximum, more or less, to about 30%. This is just very simple mathematics. It's just the ratio of the, of the number of people who are PCR positive in their first 10 days and PCR positive post those first 10 days. This isn't even asking about the, the true culturability of the virus. So this is the most bare bones view of uh, the, the expectation that sensitivity is not, uh, of these tests is not expected to be 100% uh, compared to PCR. We expect it to only be between 30 and 60% uh, even if it's 100% sensitive, but it's only positive when people are supposed to be isolating. So this one piece, I'm, I'm, I'm staying on the slide for a bit because it is probably the, if I want people to take one thing away from this, uh, from my talk anyway, it's this piece. These tests are, are uh, very, very good to catch contagious people, even when they're showing 30 to 60% sensitivity against PCR. PCR is simply not specific to the contagious period. We usually think that it's the antigen test that's not sensitive. It's that our gold standard is not specific to contagiousness. That's very important, I think. So do they actually do what I'm suggesting? Do they detect during the infectious window? This is a study we just uh, completed where we actually took people in quarantine. We tested them near daily with PCR and with an ANOVA rapid antigen test. This is the test that's used in the UK. And what we found is that uh, while on day zero, the very first day that people convert to PCR positivity, the test doesn't perform very well, uh, which we can see in the expectation from the, from the viral load curve that I have on the top there. Uh, by day one, it's catching 80% of people. And by day two, it's catching 100% of people who are infectious. Uh, and so in this day zero, we're not going to get that PCR result back anyway until day one, two, or three, depending on where you are. So these tests are working extremely well to catch people in this very short window when they are most transmissible. And then you see this very quick uh, dive down in sensitivity or, or percent positive agreement until day 10. And that's not a reflection of the test performing poorly. That's a reflection, as you can see at the top right, of people clearing their virus and uh, uh, at least clearing the infectious virus that would be detectable on these but still all of these, many people are remaining RNA positive for 15 or 20 or 25 days. 
Uh, so speed matters. This is just a, a thought experiment to, to show why speed matters. If you have five people walk into a school or a workplace who are infectious and you have a 100% sensitive PCR test, but it takes two days to return results, or on the bottom, you have those same five kids walk into a school, but you have an 80% sensitive rapid test. Overall, the, the five kids walking in getting the 100% sensitive PCR test, there's going to be 10 person days walking around infectious before those results are obtained. On the other hand, with the rapid test, even though it's less sensitive on the, on the first go around, you're going to catch four people immediately. So you're ultimately going to have two person days of somebody walking around infectious overall, infecting maybe one or two additional people versus on the top five or eight additional people and sending a lot more people to quarantine. So it, the speed is just so much more crucial than the analytical sensitivity to find people who are infectious and pull them out uh, versus a laboratory test if it takes 24, 48 hours. So I'm gonna wrap up. I just have a couple more slides, um, but this is to show that frequency is what matters. Uh, and again, this is because the only way that you're going to catch people in that infectious window is if you're testing frequently. Many people are asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic anyway, when they are transmitting. So if you're not testing them until they become symptomatic and then you're using a PCR test, you're missing almost their entire infectious window. But if you test frequently, the sensitivity, the limit of detection, whether it's PCR or, or an antigen test really doesn't matter. It is the frequency that matters more than anything else. The moment you start testing everyone every two weeks, you're really getting almost no real benefit from your testing program. It's also the speed. The moment you get to a 48 hour delay, then you are getting, you are losing a huge amount of the benefit from even an every three day testing program. If you're waiting two days to get results, you're losing a majority of the benefit or a large fraction of the benefit depending on the kind of test versus if you have 24 hour return of results or uh, rapid test results. So, um, and, and this is just to, to, to finish, this is to suggest that we can do this, if we can do this at a large population level, if we can get testing out to say 50% of the community, you can have a whole 50% of the community discard the results, go and, and, and sort of uh, pretend like they didn't even use a test, Throw the, throw the results away. You can have another 10% of tests completely fail. Um, but the goal here is just to get R below one and keep it there. So that means we just have to have a testing program that will take 100 infectious people and get them to only infect 90 people. It doesn't have to be 100 people infect zero. If we can get 100 infectious people to infect 90 people, then we start winning a battle against an epidemic. We start to see exponential decay versus exponential growth. And that's the power of getting R below one, not necessarily to zero, just below one. And we could start to tackle uh, pandemics very, very quickly uh, in that way. So uh, while we have prioritized sensitivity over all else, I think we should be prioritizing the frequency and the cost and the accessibility uh, of testing and the speed to get results uh, should be prioritized. The analytical sensitivity and concerns about that uh, should really be uh, very, very secondary. Uh, just uh, this was uh, James Hay and Brian Wilder helped with some of the modeling, as well as Dan Laramore and Milan Tambe and Aishani Atresh uh, have been collaborating closely with all of this work. Thank you very much. Michael, I'm gonna um, put one question to you that's come into us. Um, I do wanna keep us moving. So if you could answer this quite quickly, it's a question from um, someone in Australia and they say that they in New Zealand have been the envy of the Western world on the way they've handled COVID-19. They have these donut days where they have zero local cases, but they've gone to extreme lengths to avoid a second wave, like in Victoria with short, sharp lockdowns, testing and tracing, regional border closures with anything over 20 cases. In fact, when B117 leaked out um, of quarantine in Brisbane and Perth, it took one case to lead to a harsh circuit breaker. Now they're saying they've got a great PCR testing surveillance system in Australia. Um, and they, but a lot of people, including them, believe that rapid testing could help reduce the need for snap lockdowns and border closures. And so they're really asking what you recommend in terms of mass screening 
for a country like that where prevalence is very low, whether that makes any difference? Yeah, I think that um, there's a, a number of ways to do it. It really depends on what your tolerance is. I think that the mantra that we should have during a pandemic like this should be, our goal isn't to stop every single case. Our goal is to stop every single outbreak. So whatever surveillance testing we actually need uh, to, especially in very, very low incidence places, um, we might want to have a program that is very sensitive to catch a case somewhere. And then we can be dynamic. We can then scale up. The nice thing about these simple rapid tests is you don't need a big logistics train to sort of make it work. You could have these tests in people's homes. And even if they're not using them, you could have a program, for example, that says, hey, we detected, um, uh, we detected viral RNA in our wastewater. We haven't had any cases in two months, but we're starting to detect uh, cases in our wastewater surveillance program. Start using rapid tests for the next three weeks um, and, uh, and, and let's squash the outbreak before it gets a chance to start. So I think there's much more dynamic ways that we can use these tests. If we just think about them a little differently than how we have uh, thought about testing overall, I think that uh, if you have almost no incidents, people probably aren't gonna wanna use the test three times a week, just you know when, when they know nobody's been infected lately. So I think we have to have some passive surveillance and then have a way to act quickly. And that's part of our preparedness programs that every country should be setting up. Um, I do want to just mention very, very briefly, because I glossed over it, specificity comes up all the time, especially in low incidence settings. Should we care about specificity? The new tests, uh, this was shown in Birmingham, it's shown in our studies. We've done over 12,000 of these rapid tests now with no false positives. We repeat every, uh, every positive a second time immediately. We've gotten concordance on all of those. So the rapid test programs have really changed. Uh, the, the, the technology has really changed from the one to two or three percent false positive rates uh, of you know early last year to where we are now. Um, but there's ways to deal with specificity as well. You can partner two tests together if you have a, a package of thirty of uh, let's say Anova tests. You could have uh, package that with two Abbott Pan Bio tests, whatever you might need to do, and that can really drive down false positive rates to almost negligible numbers. And in fact, in our hands, we're getting more false positives on PCR than we are on rapid antigen tests. So specificity is absolutely crucial, but it's uh, the, we have to start changing how we think about it uh, in the context of rapid testing. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, we've got Professor Tim Pito from Oxford, who's gonna talk about his research into the effectiveness of lateral flow tests. Tim. Oh, you're muted. I think they're putting up the slides for me, I hope. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to come. And I've got no conflicts of interest for people who are interested in that. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, is that COVID health warning. Uh, normally we do healthcare policies on evidence beyond reasonable doubt. The problem is that it takes years to do the work properly. And they talk about first doing no harm. In a pandemic setting, We've got to try to give ideas in days or weeks because obviously we're in a hurry. So we're doing things as the worldwide on the evidence on the balance of probability. And I think it's one of the um, problems about certain people are bothered by the, the standard evidence. Clearly we're doing this in a hurry and the idea is to do harm reduction rather than perfection. You know, perfect, perfection is any really good. Can we go on to the next slide? Um, so that, I'm just going over a little bit what um, Michael said. We've got the, P, the existing toolbox is the PCR test, which measures RNA fragments, tells you about current or recent infection. The antibody test tells you, have you got antibodies? Have you been infected in the past? Are you immune? Next slide, please. Um, so why do we test? This is rather a sort of simple version, but I was thinking about this. If I want to have a test, I, I test because I, I feel ill and I want to know is the COVID the cause of my illness? And then the PCR test is really very good for that. It tells you you currently, although recently um, got COVID, might be responsible for your symptoms. Hospitals do that and it's sensible. The second question is, am I immune to COVID? And we're getting increasing evidence about that. So you can either say, we can either say, have I had past infection of 
evidence of infection, so I can use a past test of a positive PCR or positive antibody, or nowadays, have I been vaccinated? In any of those, answer to any of those two questions are yes. I think you can say you're immune, not part of this symposium, another symposium, should we have immune passports? But that's another discussion. Next slide. But today we're talking about, am I infectious? Now, how do we do that? Well, in the past, you asked the question, where have I been? Have I been in contact with somebody with COVID? Am I in the wrong place? Have I been to a foreign country? Those are the questions that are asked. That is a poor method, epidemiologically, of finding out whether I'm infectious. We know it's useless. It's got a poor sensitivity and a poor positive predictor value. You, you pick up too many people and miss many. The second question is, how do I feel? Have I got a fever? You've probably all been to places where they do fever screens. Or have I got COVID-like symptoms, or for that matter, any symptom, fatigue, anything? Again, we know perfectly well that even during periods of transmission, it, you know, if you've got those symptoms, you've only got probably about a 10% chance of having COVID. And lots and lots of people, as we know, will have COVID without those symptoms. So they're neither good or, or specific or sensitive. Now, those are, the, those are the current methods of looking for infectivity. Next um, slide. Um, then we go on to laboratory tests. And Martin went through this in detail that PCR is not a good test for infectivity. Probably half the PCR positives, I won't go over that argument again, are people, from people who are no longer infectious. So it's got a poor false positive rate. If you're got COVID symptoms and PCR positive, you probably are infectious. But there are very few people in that category, so really that doesn't um, lead us very much. So I can go to the next slide. So uh, how helpful lateral flow devices, we know about those, pregnancy type tests. Um, the third point there, they're using monoclonal antibodies. And in principle, monoclonal antibody um, technology is a chemistry that is very specific and very sensitive. So if in the end, third generation tests in the future, they will be very, very good. Like pregnancy tests now are very, very good. But we have to accept that we're just in the here and now, and they may not be perfect, but they're, that's where we, there is a good hope. Let's go on. Next slide. So what did we do? Well, we were asked to evaluate by the Department of Health, natural flow tests, together at Oxford, together with PHE Porton. We've done now over 90 tests. I think we might even today be, have done the hundredth test. And about 15 kits have, so far have gone through the hoops and considered you suitable for use. And as Michael said, these people, these tests have got very low false positive rates. And we have to do an awful lot of testing to go to show it's less than one in a thousand. So we test a thousand in our screening at Porton. That's about the limit. And if you're going to get any, that's cool. That's the one in a thousand. Um, and then it never was launched first because that was the first manufacturer that gave us enough kits to properly evaluate. That was the main reason why Innova was ahead of the game. Next one. And just to go through this, this is the first slide with data in. And what we've got there is we've got, we've got a number of people um, who were tested. And you can see left-hand side how many people in every category were tested. And each block tells you how much viral load there was in those people as measured by the PCR test. And you can see how many are positive in the pink and how many are negative in the white. And the dots tell you, looking at the right hand side, the proportion positive lateral flow tests, depending on the viral load. And you can see if it's more than about 10,000 um, viral load, most of them are positive. And if you've got very little viral load, then they're going to be negative, exactly as Michael said. And overall, in this particular group of patients, about 78% were positive. Now, clearly, if you've got a group of patients you're looking at who've got low viral loads, then they have a lower positivity rate. So all the positivity rate tells you is whether the people got low viral loads, like they had their illness a week or two ago, or whether they got current illness, and then they will have high viral loads to get a high positivity. Um, next slide, please. I mean, we, we also compared this to different settings, and we're going to hear from Liverpool, LIB, Liverpool results. But what this trial slide shows you that with different barrel loads, 0 to 3, low barrel load, bottom right, 7 to 10, high barrel load, the results depend on um, how many are positive, depends on the barrel load. And I'm going on about this because, again, the idea of sensitivity 
of a test, this, a single number does not really tell you how it's working. Next slide. So what we want to know is, is it good enough actually to take infectiousness? And Michael is saying that to us, and I want to say we've got more data on this. So first point, we are pretty good at saying that lack of flow devices um, detect high and medium viral load. And biologically, I think it's quite plausible that high viral load is related to infectiousness. Luckily, the PCR machine, which we use, although you get as a user a yes, no result, if you look under the bonnet in the machine, you can actually get the viral load. And that is very helpful for this study. Um, this is a matter of in brackets. They're not calibrated between machines. It's quite difficult to compare viral loads between machines at the moment, because we haven't got, it's only one year in, I haven't done that properly, but within one machine, one lab is very good. And we, what we did, we looked at the infections of individuals with different viral loads. We use a test and trace center in the UK where people go up for testing and the positive case is found positive. We, they then identify with a trace bit, their contacts. And some contacts in turn go back and get tested. So in that way, we got 40,000 case contact pairs. We could analyze them and ask the question, is the contact positive or negative dependent on the viral load of the donor? And we can get that relationship. Um, one warning is we made no allowance for third party transmissions. Some people who were named by the donor as being a possible contact, the contact is positive, but possibly they got it from somebody else. Let's go on, next slide. So left-hand panel tells you how the infectivity varies um, according to viral loads. So if you look at the top one, that's household. Household contacts, if you've got a high viral load on the left-hand side, about 15% are positive contacts. And if you go down to the very bottom of a low viral load, it's about um, 3%. And as I said before, that might be, those might be false. That 3% might be too high, might have got them somewhere else. We wrote it us for interest, shows you that household visitors are less, do it less, have less infection. This and um, if you have a work colleague, you've got a lower chance of infecting them. That's not surprising because clearly a household contact, you have longer and more intimate contact with them than a mere um, work colleague. The right hand side gives you some idea of the distribution of viral loads in the um, in the people coming up to test and trace. And note at the right hand side, there's a very small number of highly infectious people, but there are not very many of them. Um, but the bulk of them are moderately infectious, and there's a long tail at the end. Next slide. So, what are we doing? We're now I'm looking at just imagine for a moment that you're going to um, a gathering, say a big wedding reception with 200 people, or what you mustn't do now, but say you do, and say lots of them are positive. And the question is, you come back positive from that gathering, what is a, what's the likely viral load of the person giving you the disease? Well, this gives you the distribution. So the bottom bit are the red ones, very high viral load, very likely if they're there to give it to you, but they're not very many of them. The oranges and the yellows are the most likely people to donate the um, virus to you because there are lots of them and they're between 10,000 and 100 million viral load. The blues, I've got low viral load, and although they, they can give you the illness, they normally don't. Most people get them from the oranges and yellows. That's what that data says. If you go to the next one, we now applied that result using the known properties of electroprochids in their sensitivity. And what you can see is they're really good. There are four different um, brands here listed. They're very good at picking up the high viral loads, the, the reds, the oranges, the yellows and they fail really on the blues. And the contention is, do the blues matter? Are we overcalling infectious or not? And for the purposes of our results, we pretend they do, and we are not talking about third party transmission. Um, next slide, please. And then lastly, we did in this, this bit of this talk, we looked at 16 kits and compared them. They all have good specificity, by the way, one and a thousand or less, and we now apply that um, the, the, the performance of those kits against viral load to our toy sense of um, the 40,000 contact, um, case contact pairs. Next slide. So what you can see here is you, for each dot is one kit. The y-axis, the left-hand side, with a, 
tells you what proportion of transmission were identified. The inner variable is about 88%, and you can see some of them are above 90%, and some of them fall a bit below 80%. And then as Michael is telling us all the time, if you try to work out from the x-axis, the horizontal axis, proportion positive in test set of 200 samples, you, you're not surprised that it picks up only 55 or 60% of the cases, because that depends on the proportion of um, low bar or low people in the mix. So what this tells us, don't look at the sensitivity as judged by the x-axis. What you want to do is to look at how what proportion of infections are picked up. Next slide. So, so far we can say that um, they're very specific, low force positive rate, 80% or more of infections are picked up. A negative test does not guarantee that you're non-infectious, we know that. And, um, and the biology of the infection means that a negative test really only lasts for about 24 hours, because you might be picking up the virus tomorrow. And, um, and I'll just give you, I think I'll go on, go on next slide. I'll skip that, that's an answer, that's a daily, daily testing on one person's infection. What's nice about it is the left first one is PCR negative and the PCR positive, strip negative, but after that it goes positive all the way through. And the last day on day 10, you'd expect to be negative and you are. It just shows you how consistent it is and how much it's got stronger it gets, but we have short of time, carry on. So the advantage is that it's a quick turnaround time, cheap, easy. We've done millions in the UK already, Tens of thousands of asymptomatic cases have already been identified and are isolated because of that. It seems to be popular. People can take control of their illness. And we do think that from our survey, people understand it. It offers the promise of early quarantine release. Next slide. Um, what's the problem? There's the confusion about PCR and LFD, which Michael's talked about. You do need to require a learning curve. And the main areas have been too much in a hurry to do it and not waiting the full 15 minutes and understanding the result in the way we're discussing today. Next slide. So can we use it to, for quarantine release? So we're doing, the best thing is to get data. So what we're doing is doing um, a planning, a proper study in the UK, 200 secondary schools, randomized in two arms, one routine screening with mandatory quarantine, normal standard of care. And the next thing is what happens if we do quarantine release daily um, contact tracing, and if you're negative, you're released. The idea, is it worth it? Do we get better results with daily contact tracing and better admission to school? That's the idea of the study, hoping to start next month. Next one. Next slide. It's sponsored by the Department of Health. And so the idea is that we, um, standard of care, regular voluntary mass screening and mandatory quarantine for 10 days for the school bubbles. Is, and because quarantine is unpopular, the, we know that not, lots of people that refuse to take up voluntary mass testing. So you don't pick up all the positive in school because people don't want to do this. But if the idea is if you have daily contact testing, allowing people to continue at school in spite of being a contact, the pilot work suggests that the uptake of voluntary testing is increased. So we end up with more positives by the screening and obviously the risk that we release positives inadvertently back into the school. So the study will compare those two things, the decreased transmission following increased voluntary testing and how that compares to the increased transmission because we missed a few and they've leaked back in. So that is the study. We will hope to get the results by the end of June to know how good this is. And we are randomizing schools because we don't know which is better. And we're seeking schools who want to join and prepare to randomize. If anybody knows any schools, any heads here, and you want to take part, you can email that number. We'd be pleased to hear from you. Thank you very much. End of, end of talk. Thank you very much, Tim. Just so you know, we're getting loads of questions, and I think some of our experts will start answering them um, in text. So keep a look out for with whether you get answers. I'm going to keep going now because I want us to get to the end of the talk so that we can start answering more of your questions. And Ian, you're going to talk to us about your experience in Liverpool. Thank you, Nushka. Yes. I'd like to uh, give a view from Liverpool, a half million population of Liverpool in the north of England, where we have deployed uh, tests, half a million tests in Liverpool and one and a half million tests in the surrounding area of Liverpool city region uh, since November. I want to consider the biological aspects, but 
really think about the community at large, the behaviors, the overall systems, how, how do we use this as a tool in overall public health responses? When we were asked to take on uh, what was called mass testing at the time, stepping back from the problem, thinking about what, what, a, what ideal test, as, as Michael's described, an ideal test, how would we use that in the real world? We don't want it to be systematic. We want to fit it, fit it in with other measures that we're using to minimize transition and minimize the consequences of COVID in our community. So we want an end-to-end -end whole system approach to testing, including adequate support for people who are isolating. We want the test to be meaningful to everybody so that the most disadvantaged communities understand and can access this risk mitigation. We need to be agile and to move according to background prevalence, to outbreak situations, to new opportunities to remove risk, and including the risks from the collateral damage of control measures that are impairing the fabric of society and economies. And I come from an area with, with very high and rising unemployment and inequalities. The nature of asymptomatic testing, getting that understood by the whole community and broadening, we've broadened very much the definition to the WHO, not just uh, the, the UK restricted definition. Repeated testing, when dealing with a moving target, does everyone understand that, including fellow professionals? The viral kinetics, which have been described uh, by Michael and Tim very eloquently, that window, that four to eight day window of infectiousness, if that's what we really want to target, does everyone understand that that moves, that the proportions of people in different phases of an epidemic, and different waves will change, and we need to be prepared to change tack. And lastly, the test itself, there's a very large series of 6,000 people with paired PCR and lateral flow tests, the interval lateral flow tests in Liverpool, doing comparative performance. But this had three phases. Let me take you from the 6th of November uh, to the present day. And these data feed live every 30, 30 minutes in, into the systems that we look at to coordinate the testing. First phase was a month of military assistance of hashtag let's all get tested, effectively a mass testing, inviting the whole population, please come get tested for the good of everybody, uh, which was very labor intensive. A quarter of the population came through in a month. The epidemic at the time was declining and in steady state because it had started with restrictions um, over there in, in tier three. We then move into another phase of testing, which was to target that testing, test before you go, test before you go to the hairdresser, to a shopping mile at the time, to uh, workplaces. And this is when Liverpool had opened in December with very few restrictions, but all of the surrounding regions had a lot of restrictions. So there's actually a lot of people traveling into Liverpool because restaurants and hotels, et cetera, were open. As uh, the whole of the UK experienced a big wave in Christmas, so, so this was mirrored in Liverpool. But then moving into national lockdown, the smart testing pivoted to those who have to go out of home to work, testing our front line. And in yellow here, you see the proportion of new cases identified by natural flow. You would expect that to be very high as an epidemic is surging because a greater proportion of people are, in, are infectious, so as we've seen earlier on. But now in lockdown, a big, a big surprise to the whole team was the sustained demand from the community. So very high numbers are sustained here of people coming forward to asymptomatic testing centers despite lockdown. And the, through February, the proportion of cases identified by lateral flow uh, has increased despite falling numbers. And there has been more sustained repeated testing in particular transmission environment. For example, the proportion of construction workers under regular testing has increased. The Christmas search, if we look uh, under the bonnet, as Tim said, of, of the PCR tests that were used um, for confirmation. So, so everyone had a positive lateral flow, had 
uh, a PCR test. Not necessary, as Michael's described, for confirmation, we could use a, another natural flow test because of the great understanding of specificities now. But uh, this was also used to track uh, variants and look for a uh, viral genome in, in the samples that were taken through in inverted commas confirmatory testing. Here you see uh, an inference from not having an S gene value, the variant that surged. So the main driver in the second period here for Liverpool was the new variant coming in. The quality assurance process. Now I want to emphasize these figures have been quite widely mis misunderstood and, and um, understandably so, it's a very complex area. But I will call this relative sensitivity. We're comparing uh, PCR from 6,000 people in Liverpool that had uh, sequential, uh, so under, within a few minutes, PCR and a lateral flow test as a sample, just to look at the relative performance. So we have relative sensitivity and specificity and predictive values. And here at a time when epidemic was in steady state, relatively low levels after decline, 40% uh, relative sensitivity actually reflected the expected and rather useful test performance if we project that to what's been presented earlier as a test of infectiousness. Further looking at the CT values, so looking at, on the, uh, the horizontal axis here, really reflecting those as approximate viral loads, as viral loads increase and people are likely to be substantially infectious. Tim used the cutoff here of 10,000 RNA copies per mil. Um, so we see we're reaching 75% and north of 80% uh, pickup. Uh, if we project that. So this is becoming a useful public health tool for the purpose of detecting and enabling isolation in, in a rapid isolation in people who are likely to pass the virus on. But it's not just a test. It's a test how it's used. Swabbing quality, faint, faint blue line reading, the timing of reading, leaving it long enough for the blue, faint blue line uh, to appear, and the lighting that uh, conditions of testing at the time, uh, whether the, the test has been stored at the right temperature and transport, etc. The end-to-end -end delivery uh, was important. And clearly, there is headroom for even further improvement, for example, app-based reading of, of test results from home. It's just a message. I don't want to dwell on confirmatory PCR because it's, it's a misnomer here, but I want to, to really focus on the importance of local engagement in a, an end-to-end -end process. Uh, here, the, the standard national process, which is quite digital heavy, uh, at the beginning of testing in Liverpool, wasn't getting the message through to go for a follow-up test if you were positive. With the introduction of localized messaging, hello, this is NHS from your local area, now go to this particular test center, and this is what to expect, and this is what to do, there was this sudden increase, this sudden jump in uh, the proportion of people who complied with that uh, request. So engagement with local teams, essential. These are the dashboards, getting those local teams across the NHS, public health groups, academic groups like mine, to look at the same data at the same time, timely data here from public health, NHS, local authorities, Simple dashboards, but getting people to think, because of what's happened in the last few days, what are we going to do differently today? This includes demographics. So here we're looking at the first month. This is November when there was military assistance. This is the mass testing phase. A quarter of the population tested, but we were missing here, if you look at the, um, uh, the 20 to 29 year old group here, and the 30 to 39, we're missing quite a large proportion of, the, of that age group that we would have expected to come forward for testing. So the young adults are underrepresented, males were underrepresented, people from deprived areas. And if we divide England up into a fifth of deprivation, actually a very large proportion of Liverpool is, is in that most deprived fifth. So this was a problem, just opening up testing had those uh, from 
the more affluent areas coming forward and unequal age groups. We then look at more targeted messaging. We respond, we think, how do you get those messages through? Uh, how can we change the location of testing centers, et cetera? Um, with test before you go, a purpose for testing, this mobilized a very large increase in the proportion of young adults getting tested. Uh, similarly, we start to fill in uh, that re really steep social gradient. The inequality that was seen before starts to level a little bit. Uh, males remain underrepresented and uh, the BAME community are underrepresented. Then move for to much further. So community uh, stations are deployed and a larger proportion of the messaging thinking about uh, how to target that to the more underrepresented groups. This is from, from January in lockdown. We fill in here, if I flick between the two, you'll see we're filling in the uh, gap between the more affluent and the more deprived areas. And we, st we still have males underrepresented, but by a relatively small amount. A larger proportion of the workforce in, in lockdown will be those who have to leave the home for work and more likely to be from deprived areas. So that's another factor to consider. Uh, overall, I can describe higher positivity and lower uptake in deprived areas. But underneath the hood is the message that this was influenced by good public health messaging and outreach over time to improve the equity. But a lot of work is required to do that and it has to be locally intensive and relevant. That means breaking down into small areas. Here's Liverpool broken down into uh, its neighborhood areas. And quite a difference in uptake here between lateral flow and PCR testing getting the different public health groups who understand those communities to go in, actually focus groups were done in particular areas where there are unexpected patterns of uptake. Other analyses here to overlay on those areas and internet user classification. When we did that, trying to really infer digital exclusion, there's a digital heavy solution to access testing. So we want to look at the risk of people being excluded because they're less confident users of internet technologies. And this explained a larger proportion of the variation than deprivation alone. So it was a, a very important factor. Uh, those with the highest uptake and uh, lowest positivity were actually what we call the E-veteran classification. And the E-withdrawn had the lowest uptake and highest positivity. There's an outlier here in, in a youthful urban fringe. So again, you have to understand those areas and adapt messaging accordingly. Similarly, site location. This is in the first month when there were a lot of sites. Really adapting, looking at the data and adapting the location of those sites. Still, um, the it was a determinant of the uptake. So the uptake fell by 11% if you were just over a kilometer further away from one of those sites. Asking large numbers of people in the community about their experiences of testing and asking those who'd attended testing centers provided very useful insights. Generally, there was strong awareness and a positive attitude towards testing. So that social identity, taking back control over own life as an individual, as a community, was a very strong motivator. Loss of income or fear of loss of income was a major barrier. Um, employers expecting more testing became a strong motivator. Specific uh, fears about catching virus at testing sites on public transport, making sites more easy to access, relevant uh, for testing and advertising waiting times, all could be adapted and were important. There's a lot of questions asked about licensing of unsafe behaviors for negative tests. From those who responded to surveys, there was not a big red flag seen in Liverpool. But I would add that further study is needed, follow-up studies of people after a negative test to really understand that. Misinformation was a major barrier, specifically about test performance, um, messages on social media. But some of that could 
be uh, clarified with good communications locally. So to conclude, the main findings here were the time and scale advantage, where rapid actions around a rapid test of, of infectiousness are a really valuable public health tool. Community have also embraced that. The general public alongside public health services uh, are using this in ever more locally creative and owned ways, really taking back control of, of reopening at the moment and preparing for that. Voluntary mass testing, forget it, it's not, it's not feasible. And it will increase inequalities, it's not practical. Uh, one size fits all pushed in the center, won't work, doesn't work. Has to be fitted by people who understand their local community to the right messages, to the right people at the right time, in the right tone um, and the right frequency. Smart framework you worked. Uh, but we're still improving it. There's a lot more to do, but test to protect, test to release from quarantine, as, as Tim has mentioned, test to enable the lifting of restrictions, huge social motivator, particularly here with, uh, with rocketing unemployment, um, are really strong factors. Those hard to reach communities, um, ask them, involve them, uh, co-create the means of agile responses to testing that fit in people's everyday lives. And our, one factor that we haven't been able to overcome is extra payment for those who need more support in isolation. Um, I think that needs considering. Locally driven communications work. And bottom line, this isn't just a test in isolation. Uh, testing alone, divorced from other control measures isn't the answer but as part of a complex public health intervention that's locally grounded, it could be extremely effective from the results of the Liverpool experience that's still evolving. And it's a component that needs to sit alongside targeted vaccination and revaccination as one system and good public health practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, Next up, we've got Eric Kutcher from New York University School of Medicine. And I understand you're gonna speak about mitigating risk among asymptomatic individuals who've got a newly diagnosed diagnosis and how we deal with positive tests. Eric. Okay, one second, let me just get this set up. Can you see my screen okay? Um, thanks so much for having me, everybody. I'm uh, yeah, Dr. Eric Kutcher here um, at NYU Langone Health in New York City. Um, I work both inpatient and outpatient, have been on the front lines of COVID for the past year, helping patients who do test positive kind of navigate their way through the system and the implications of the test results. Um, and before the COVID pandemic, worked primarily in harm reduction for HIV. Um, so we'll be drawing from some of those experiences as well as the research that's been done out there. So briefly, um, what I'll be talking about today is the theory of mass testing. We've heard a lot about it, and I'll break it down a little bit more to talk about the barriers that exist when we use mass testing um, to barriers to self-isolation and ways that we can facilitate those barriers in order to make self-isolation more feasible. I'll talk about harm reduction and risk mitigation and then go through a couple of the strategies that we use here in New York um, that I've used for my patients in order to try and reduce their risk of spreading COVID to others. So first, this is like the thousand mile of bird's eye view um, <laughs> understanding of mass testing, but I think it's important to go back to the basics. So the idea here that we've all talked about, asymptomatic COVID person can transmit to other people who are infected, right? And so the idea of mass testing is that we identify that COVID positive person, and then we can put them into isolation so that they don't infect others. Um, there are two types of isolation that have mostly been used across the globe. There is managed isolation, which is what we were seeing predominantly in China early on in the pandemic, where people who tested positive were removed from society, put into isolation facilities um, where there was a significant amount of oversight and enforcement about isolation, and then people were only let go when they were deemed no longer infectious to others. 
Um, this type of management uh, is something that in the US and in other um, Western countries is not seemed as acceptable in terms of human right to be able to be around and, and, um, and stay at home. And so we instead go down a self isolation pathway, right? And in terms of that, the idea is we give you a positive test result. We trust you to isolate it at home. We don't necessarily enforce it. Sure, we might have laws about it, but um, there's no true enforcement and there's no true oversight. And what we know, and as a lot of people have already pointed out, is that at home is where COVID tends to be spreading. And so we know that people who have high numbers of people who live at home um, have higher rates of transmission, and that actually it's also higher rates of death, depending on how many people you live at home with. And this is exacerbated by socioeconomics, so people from poorer backgrounds um, and people who are coming from uh, other underserved populations, racial disparities persist and exacerbate many of these things. And so what kind of is happening now, right, um, and with the mass testing reality is that we identify these asymptomatic COVID patients and we tell them to go into self-isolation, hoping that we do our best to decrease transmission, um, but some of them still are able to transmit. And so I think the question that I'll be focusing on is how can we improve self-isolation as we identify more positive cases through mass testing? Because the entire strategy that we're talking about relies on um, compliance and work of self-isolation. And so I think the first thing to understand is the barriers that are um, in place to people who are able to self-isolate. And so um, there have been a couple of studies that have been done about this um, and housing instability is one big factor. So if you don't have a place where you can isolate by yourself um, or if you're homeless, then the idea of being able to self-isolate is very difficult. People who don't have access to food regularly who are out looking for food also um, difficulty isolating people who are unemployed or in poverty, um, who don't have enough money to be able to stay at home, um, or whose work requires them to go into work every day to keep making money, or is un uh, isn't willing to give them time off because they are um, positive. People who have family obligations. So we're talking here about mothers and fathers who have to take care of their kids or taking care of uh, their, their grandparents. Um, we're also talking here about you know, the rollout of mass testing for children. And so um, you know, the implications of their positive test results on, uh, on their parents' ability to continue working. We have immigration status, which is always a hot topic in the United States um, in terms of people who are too scared to get tested um, and who themselves, when they are tested, are concerned about taking advantage of resources that exist. There are people with medical illnesses um, and decreased mobility who are unable to um, isolate because of their needs of involvement in the medical system. There are people who have a lot of isolation difficulties from a perspective of mental health. So a significant burden of depression and anxiety that we've seen increase um, in the US, but globally as well um, during this pandemic because of isolation. And then another key point here is disinformation, misinformation, mistrust, and stigma. So people are scared to admit that they're positive if they test positive. They don't want people to judge them. They don't want people to think that they did something wrong. Um, and that some people still, you know, <laughs> a year later still have a hard time understanding and believing in the transmission of COVID and the COVID reality. And so these are some of the barriers that we have and we face to successful isolation. So luckily we have a lot of ways that we can take care of these barriers. Um, you know, in New York, uh, we've been able to do some of these. So housing instability, we've been able to provide free housing and shelter through hotel programs here in the city. Uh, food instability, the importance of getting food delivery to a place so that people don't have to go to the grocery store and do other errands, giving um, unemployment benefits, financial stipends to those who test positive, making sure that there's paid sick leave and work leave, trying to get availability of child care and elder care for people who have obligations to families, making sure that any sort of testing and um, use of, of resources is not um, used against somebody for immigration purposes, getting connection to primary care doctors and really utilizing telemedicine in order to enhance overall health. Um, focusing on mental health through talking to therapists and psychiatrists, and then um, really trying to do overall educational campaigns and destigmatizing de COVID. Um, and so, as I said, in New York City, we've been lucky that we have one of the uh, most outstanding health departments uh, that really has been looking out for us. Um, and so uh, we have hotel rooms that people can go to if they need to isolate, they get free Wi-Fi um, and, uh, you know, some medication deliveries, and then they even get these take care boxes that are sent to them if they test positive. 
And so I kind of want to touch on some of the points um, that, that we've all been thinking about, right, which is obviously this degree of structural interventions and these structural supports that we're putting out there for people who are isolating are very difficult. They are very expensive and they take a lot of coordination and support. So as we try to build up those resources and those supports that are necessary in order to overall help the patients who test positive, um, you know, we can't let perfect be the enemy of good. And we need to start focusing on a harm reduction and risk mitigation strategy. So trying to, you know, decrease the risk of transmission of COVID in our communities for people who are not able to self-isolate completely perfectly. So harm reduction and risk mitigation are, um, are ideas that really have come up through the history of the um, HIV AIDS epidemic. Um, they're kind of flip sides of the same coin with harm reduction focusing on trying to reduce the transmission of disease, uh, sorry, the acquisition of disease and risk mitigation of trying to reduce the spread of disease. And so from a harm reduction perspective, we've done a lot of things in the past with this. So needle exchange programs, using condoms and promoting safer sex, using pre-exposure prophylaxis. And so those are all ways that individuals who um, are at risk of contracting disease can you know, not get it. And so for COVID, the parallels are easy. It's wearing masks, it's keeping your social distancing, um, you know, that type of before you could possibly be exposed, trying to decrease your risk of exposure. Um, from a risk mitigation stance, I think it's a little bit more nuanced. And so here, this idea is that in New York during the, uh, the 80s, 90s, and early thousands in particular, we were having a hard time getting the uh, HIV AIDS pandemic uh, epidemic under control. And so things like free housing and insurance to people who tested positive for HIV are things that were rolled out here and allowed people to be able to take their antiretrovirals. And what we know is that if you take your antiretrovirals, you're less likely to transmit HIV. And so similarly with COVID, if you, um, you know, deal with your acute infection, you're less likely to transmit it later on. Um, and then, you know, anonymous contact tracing um, and partner tracing is one of those other things that we've looked at um, in the risk mitigation side for HIV that has parallels here to COVID as well. So limited data on this approach with risk mitigation and harm reduction really exists right now. This is still um, something that we're trying to, to figure out and understand. And from a theory perspective, we've got a, a, a couple of, of people who've been looking into this. Um, and you know, from a practicality perspective, this is what the New York City um, Department of Health has been using in trying to give everybody who tests positive some real uh, ideas as to how to take care of themselves and decrease the spread. And so um, individual risk mitigation techniques are something that we, we owe telling our patients about um, and telling the public about as they are tested on a frequent basis. So if you test positive, what are things that you can do and you are responsible to do in your own um, life in order to decrease the risk of getting others sick? And I think the first one that we know is you have to disclose your, your status to others. So the importance of telling those you live with um, and those you may have interacted with that you are, are, have tested positive for COVID um, and that they need to get quarantined and get tested themselves. We need to enforce strict mask wearing and recommend that those who do test positive uh, for COVID are wearing their masks um, to decrease the risk of spread to others and enforce strict hand washing. Um, something that we don't talk that much about is the role of meals and eating during the pandemic um, and the idea that people who test positive who are self-isolating should be not eating with others while they're at home um, and should you know, kind of be eating alone to decrease their risk. Um, managing symptoms, so people who are coughing and have mild symptoms do have increased risk of spread. Um, and, you know, trying to take cough suppressants can be something that it's helpful. So then the idea of, you know, getting delivery services. So if your groceries and medications are brought to you, you don't have to worry about going outside as much and putting others at risk. And then working from home when you're able. But there's a second side of this, which is really helping patients create a, a space that's safer for themselves and their families. So I think the first part is if you're unable to have a place where the, the COVID positive person uh, can go to isolate, that they can you know, spend time with, uh, the COVID negative person can spend time with friends and family and be removed from that setting to decrease risk of transmission. Um, you know, uh, creating walled off areas and sealed off areas within the home is really important. Um, I remember earlier on in the pandemic, I had a phone call with a woman who lived with seven people in a one bedroom apartment in New York City, and she had COVID symptoms. And we had to strategize ways for her to kind of wall off a part of it. And she wound up using one of those um, folding room dividers as a way to try and keep herself separate from other people. Again, is that the perfect way to reduce COVID risk transmission? Uh, COVID transmission? No, but it's a risk mitigating effort. 
Um, sleeping in separate spaces can be helpful. And if you um, really can't do that, then at least sleeping head to toe. Um, using different bathrooms, we know that fecal matter can transmit uh, COVID-19. And so making sure that you're not using the same bathroom and cleaning shared surfaces. Uh, similarly, saliva can transmit COVID. So making sure that you're using different plates, cups, and utensils improving ventilation through the use of windows, making sure that the ventilation isn't going just though from the COVID positive individual into the house to everybody else, but really making sure that you're strategic about where people are placed when windows are open. And then the last point a lot of my patients have had uh, a lot of issues with, which is ensuring that there's entertainment available, right? If you're asking people to stay home for 10 days and not see others and not do anything, trying to put into place provisions where um, your, your patient and people who test positive um, have the ability to keep themselves occupied so that they're able to, strip, to stick with that self-isolation is really important. So I'll end by saying that we have an obligation to those that we test, that as we ramp up uh, mass testing and try and encourage people to test as much as, possi as possible, um, we need to recognize the stigma and the fear that comes with a positive test result and provide counseling and guidance to those who test positive so that they're able to self-isolate, so that they're able to be engaged with the medical system and so they can keep themselves and their families safe. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very um, much for that. So we've got um, one more um, speaker, Ryan Wayne from the Tony Blair Institute for Global Change. And then after that, I'll take as many questions as I can. It might not be loads, but we will do our best. Ryan. Great. Hopefully you can see my presentation. Um, first and foremost, thank you so much for inviting me along today. Um, the Tony Blair Institute has done a lot of work on COVID. I lead a small team in the Institute that focuses on COVID-19 policy for the government to be work with, but also to inform some of the political interventions that Tony has made here in the UK and that we ourselves have made of a team. And I think it's an important point actually, because it's the, the politics of this where these things stop and fall down. I think we've heard some excellent presentations today um, that really, really do make the case for mass testing and in particular rapid lateral flow tests playing a bigger role in the, the reopening of the economy and, and future pandemic preparedness. Um, but you've probably got every right to ask, why are we talking to someone from the Tony Blair Institute? Well, we alighted on the idea of mass testing some time ago, back in March, 2020. And from speaking to scientists, we saw a real opportunity for government to develop an alternative to the blunt tool of lockdown. I'll come to that a little bit more later. We also saw opportunities for testing within schools, um, but also the need for political leadership on this at a domestic and indeed international level. Um, it's been a long conversation. COVID felt like a hell of a long time, but looking forward, I think there's still a big need for this political leadership, both domestically and internationally. And again, we come back to that shortly. So short answer to the big question, can we reopen society through mass testing? A classic politician's answer, yes, but first and foremost, we have to be clear on the objective here. Mass testing is about developing an alternative to lockdown. And what it does not do is remove risk altogether. I think we've seen that today from the presentations. So we have to accept that the objective of a mass testing regime is to live safely and freely alongside the, vi the virus. And within that, it's some sort of acceptance of risk. Second, in the context of the current pandemic, how long do we need mass testing for? Now, we've grappled with this question and we, well, there's many different answers to it. One of the weak things that we've alighted on is that vaccine rollout is going at a good pace here in the UK, but internationally, you'll all recognize this graphic from The Economist. It looks like the continent of Africa won't be vaccinated until 2023 onwards. And that's a real challenge because it means that there's gonna be a lot of people unprotected. It means that COVID's gonna be in circulation. And it also means that new strains still have the possibility of developing, which could become resistant to antibodies and vaccines. But in a world where we do have significant numbers of people domesticated here in the, vaccinated here in the UK, and we know that vaccines have a positive impact on transmission, when we're designing a system in the current context, I think it's important to think about who participates. And there's a couple of options here. One is everyone, and certainly the future pandemics, that's an option. But in this current context, we've limited to those who aren't vaccinated 
Um, and what mass testing allows us to do is not only live safely and freely alongside the virus, but it's also leveling up. It's leveling up to those who don't have access to a vaccine, who can't have a vaccine. So there's application here in the UK to remove some of the discrimination that's probably been talked about, especially in regards to health passports. But certainly there's uh, application globally and pray not, future pandemics, we need to make sure that we've got infrastructure that's ready to go. The PM's talked about this lockdown being irreversible. We need to make sure that is the case by having mass testing infrastructure. It is, in our opinion, the only alternative to the blunt tool of lockdown. So we developed a very simple model, which you'll probably recognise from some of the conversations today. We call it the STAIR model. And STAIR for us is screening, followed by tracing, and then for some isolation, and then recording results and repeating this. So in the screening, you see very simply, someone takes a rapid test. If they get a green light, they're good to go. Then they get a time limited result recorded in the COVID certification. And that in itself may allow them to access certain venues or settings that they wouldn't otherwise been able to do so. And the real life examples of this, which we'll touch on later, if they test positive with a rapid test, then they get a confirmatory PCR test. And obviously this is subject to the technology as it develops around the specificity of rapid tests, test negative on that, and they go back into the, the same regime where they get a time limited result recorded. But if not, and we're going to touch on some of these now, they isolate with financial support um, and then eventually, obviously, they will be released from the isolation and their contacts are traced forward and backwards. So we're going to break this down now into each area. So we'll start with screening. The guys who've gone before me have done a phenomenal job on what I think has been sorely needed, which is PR support for rapid tests. They hold the answer. They play a very specific role. We must see them as a system, not as an individual test. It's comparable to the gold standard PCR test. And I think from Michael's presentation onwards, that case has been made. And again, borrowing Michael's graphics, they identify those who are infectious, not those who are carrying some viral load. They are different from PCR tests and certainly done regularly and with frequency. They, they will pick up those who are infectious and take them out of isolation. And I think the government's getting this. We're starting to see lateral flow tests now overtaking PCR tests here in the UK as the, as the test of choice. But as we just heard from Ian, the system only works if we have participation. Now, this is taken from the interim report on the community testing pilot. We heard this before, but the figures show that the uptake of lateral flow tests, so the, the voluntary uptake, was double the in, in the amongst the wealthiest people in Liverpool compared to the poorest people, but then flipped on its head when it came to who was more likely to test positive. So poorer people, most deprived areas less likely to get a test, but when they do get a test, more likely to test positive. So in our system, in our mass testing system, we need incentives. And those incentives can be one of two things, freedom. And we saw that with Slovakia, they managed to test 95% of their population in a weekend. And they did that by giving people a certificate, a paper certificate that gave them access to restaurants and other settings. Or we saw the same with the University of Illinois in Chicago, who pioneered um, a testing regime very, very early on. And if you've got a negative test, that gave you access to your campus, to your buildings, to your education, to your learning. So freedom can be one incentive. The other can be money. And this draws on a paper from Paul Roma, who recommended that every time someone goes and gets a test, they enter a lottery and you can win a big amount of money and essentially a test equals a lottery ticket. TBI have actually designed a slightly different alternative to this and releasing a paper over the weekend, which looks at actually paying people to be tested, that money being accumulated in a digital wallet, and that money then being unlocked when case rates are low and you're able to spend it on your local high street or maybe even give that money to charity. So we need two incentives to drive participation, freedom and money. Tracing. So tracing needs to work in two ways. And thankfully, we're starting to do this more in the UK. We need forward tracing, which is the immediate and high yield tracing where you look at who people who test positive have interacted with, but you also need backwards contact tracing as well. So trying to work backwards to the source of the initial contact of the initial case. And this is because we know that in COVID, a smaller number of people, a disproportionate amount of people are responsible for a higher amount of cases. 
So by able, being able to identify these super spreading events or super spreading settings, as we call them, we're able then to better inform our policy decisions. So once something has been identified as a super spreader setting, what happens? Well, we recommend two things. First and foremost, if it's a live super spreader setting, as in we are tracing cases that have come from that very quickly, then we're able to introduce surge testing and try and identify every positive case and their contacts that may have come from that. But even longer term, being able to distinguish between settings that may have super spreader setting status, awful for the Scouse accent, we'll be able to make policy decisions such as identifying them as settings that need extra testing. So a good example here is with schools. We may distinguish, for example, we may give super spreader setting status to a urban inner city primary uh, secondary school with 2,000 kids. And we may not do that with a single form entry rural primary school where we may then not need to give them tests as frequently or at all. Isolation. Again, this has been touched on um, by my colleagues in a very, very brilliant way. But the data here is stark. People aren't isolating when they need to. And this turns the 22 billion spent on test and trace here into a colossal waste of money if we don't have people actually isolate when they're told to do. And also completely undermines any mass testing system. So we need to do two things. We need to provide financial support, remove barriers to isolation. And we need strict fines and punishments. I'll just give you an example here. In the UK, if you're a low earner, you get 500 quid. But actually in Finland, in Norway, you get 100% of your salary, 80% of your salary, same as South Korea. And then the fines, the UK, you know, there's strict punishment there. But actually in Finland, where the incentive is significant, where the support mechanism is significant, the fines are also significant and you risk imprisonment. The same with Norway and the same with South Korea as well. So there's something to look at there in terms of driving compliance with isolation from both a, a carrot and stick perspective. Then we go into this issue of recording, which has been an area of focus for TBI in the last couple of months. Um, referred to as health passports, we call it health certification. And here it's about reopening society by recording COVID test status, as well as vaccine test status. And one of the limitations of this debate has been that when we talk about health passports, the media tends to talk about vaccine passports. It needs to be bigger than that. As you can see from my viral tweet there, well, three retweets later, what we need is to broaden the concept of vaccine passports, the vaccine and testing passports, so that those who can't get vaccines or haven't been vaccinated yet are able to get a test and that's able to unlock them. And this technology is evolving. You can see in the middle there, um, this is a piece of technology developed by Excalibur, an approved lateral flow test here in the UK. You could have a code, you could take a picture of this at home and your test result is uploaded. That may be time limited and gives you access to certain venues. It serves your health certificate essentially, but it needs to include vaccine and testing status. We need time limit test results. We saw before that we're only measuring the window of effectiveness. We need to control and organize that behavior. So test results may expire after 72 hours, for example. It needs to be available online and offline. As I said earlier, we need equal status between those who are only being tested and those who are being vaccinated. And of course, we need to make sure that data remains confidential and protected. This is happening already. So Israel has launched the Green Pass. Now, this is initially for those with, who've been vaccinated, but they've also now announced that in Israel, if you haven't been vaccinated, but you get a negative test, you also can have access to the Green Pass. Uh, it allows you access to high-risk activity, so it's opened up bars and cafes, and people are using this now on a regular basis. Um, and if you abuse the system, th again, there are strong disincentives to avoid that behavior. And you can see here, it's available both online and offline, there's a digital health passport, and there's also a, an offline Green Pass too. So that's where we are. Screen, test, isolate, record. You can see how that system works. It's a blueprint that would need to be adapted depending on local need, national need. Uh, we think it's got applicability here in the UK in the short and medium term, and certainly for future pandemics. And also in some of the countries we work with, for example, in Africa, where vaccines seem a long way off, you can see how having a, a system where people are regularly tested, are able to upload or share the results and swap that in for some sort of certification that may help reopen their societies, reopen their economies in a safe and sustainable way as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for all your talks. Um, I'm gonna bring in some questions now and I'm gonna ask all our speakers to be quite quick um, when they answer so we can get in as many as possible. I think Michael has had to pop off for 
an interview, but he has been answering questions in the written panel. So you can have a look at, especially at the ones that were directed um, at him. Um, I'm gonna um, try and kind of fire these out to different people. And I've got a couple of my own that I wanna add in. Um, Tim, let me start with you because there is a question here for you about the common mistakes that are causing the drops in accuracy. Whilst, whilst we've all done this, I have actually completed my test. Um, I think this means that it worked. I think this means that it is negative. And I have a question about that um, in the next session, in the next bit. But let me ask you this. It's obviously not difficult to do because of that. But you said that there are common mistakes. What are they? And this person's asking what training requirements will be needed to ensure that members of the public obtain the appropriate expertise and sufficient experience to do it properly in order to mitigate these risks if implemented in real world settings, especially when there are vulnerable populations? I, mean, I think the word training is slightly too serious. It's not difficult to do. Anybody can do it. It's like a pregnancy test. You can do pregnancy tests wrong. And so the question is, I think it's like a boiling a softball egg. Everybody can do it. But the first time you do it, you probably make a mistake. What do you do wrong? I think you're too hurried. You've got to put it in your nose properly, and swirl around many times, both nostrils, and you don't bother. You've got to get it, so you've got to get the virus on the swab. And having got it on the swab, you've got to put it in the buffer and get it off the swab into the buffer by stirring around 10 times and squeezing the swab and making certain the virus leaves the swab to go into the buffer. That's common sense. But if you're hurried and don't bother, then it won't happen. Then you can take the two drops and put it on the, and wet the kit. I think that's quite easy. And then you've got to wait. Now, many positives come up at five minutes when you're strongly positive or even one minute or instantly, but there are a small number of people that go positive at 15 minutes towards the end, 20 minutes. There's a reason for waiting that long and many people are simply too impatient. And I think that are the main errors. And some people, of course, record it wrong. It's obviously positive, And for some reason, they say it's negative or the other way around. And those are trivial mistakes because the photograph would tell you it's wrong, but people are people. I don't think it's the, I don't think it's really training. It's just, do they really want to get the right result? Do they mind? And I think pregnancy test people want the right result. So if you do the test and want the right result, I think you'll get it. Brilliant, thank you. And um, there's a couple of questions here from PA and let me put the first half of it to you, Irina. Um, it's from Aim Fox. I hope I'm saying that right. Are, are lateral flow tests likely to become part of the public's daily routine? To go to work, we know that's already happening, but she adds to go to the theatre, to go to the pub. What are the advantages of that? I think a lot of you have covered some of that in your talks, but also what are the drawbacks? You know, for example, I mean, this isn't the first one I've done. I've been doing it repeatedly for work. How do you persuade people like me that this negative test I keep getting isn't a kind of golden ticket to take risks? Well, I, I think uh, it is an opportunity actually to do things that we haven't done for the last year. And, and if we get the overall number of people infected in our society uh, low, I see the lateral flow test as an extra layer of security. I, I would much rather go to the cinema knowing that everybody else has tested around me before I go into the cinema. But I wouldn't go into the cinema if there is a very high level of infection in general in the society, then I wouldn't feel safe. But I see it as an extra layer of uh, safety at a point where we have a low prevalence in general in the population. Okay, thank you. And can I put the second half of this question to you, Eric, which is, should lateral flow tests become an obligatory part of travel? So air passengers taking a test at the airport shortly before boarding a flight as an extra protection to the PCR test already required in the lead up to a flight. Sure, so I think I actually want to first comment on the first part because I think it's really interesting from the HIV epidemic, what we know is that people who test negative for HIV are more likely to have a risk compensation behavior afterwards. So maybe that means like more likely to have unprotected sex after a negative test result. And what you do in order to you know prepare for that is you talk to patients and make them know the like, limitations of it, but also the importance of continued social distancing. And so I think all of us who are in advocating for mass testing have said, 
said, you have to continue wearing your masks and you have to continue social distancing, even if you test negative. And so that's the component that I think would allow it to, to be okay. Um, I think similarly for flights, it's the same limitation. So if you, if you do, um, this is a requirement beforehand, um, I think that it sounds like it would work really well to decrease the risk of transmission on the flights. Brilliant, thank you. Just just on this, I mean, it's not specifically around testing, but Ryan, you mentioned the idea of the Green Pass in Israel, and this is a kind of issue that uh, me and my colleagues are constantly arguing about, and we all get quite fired up about it, because, you know, we have a situation in which we know that certain groups are more hesitant about having a vaccine, and I presume you get similar things in other parts of the response to COVID, so BAME people, for example, may be more hesitant, or poorer people may be more hesitant. I mean, if you're going to start saying that these are the things that you need to have in order to access things that, you know, are, are kind of human rights, which is the right to, you know, go to the pub or go to the shops or whatever it is. Isn't there a risk that you're going to discriminate against certain sections of society? I think by including testing, it, it actually does the opposite because pubs have been closed for some time now. So the, that right can be taken away. And as they start to reopen, I think there's going to be a couple of things. One is that the, the confidence that Arena talked about before from other people in a venue and a setting being safe, or at least the risk being low of catching COVID, is going to be important. So I can see where there would be calls for proof of vaccine status, for example. And we know that vaccine, re vaccine reduces transmission, so that's a sensible thing to do. By introducing testing, what you are able to do then is people who aren't vaccinated can get a test and then have exactly the same rights and freedoms as everyone else. But I think the bigger thing here is that it's about ultimately trying to manage COVID and manage the pandemic to a point where you don't need any of these measures anymore. But we're talking about a, what could be a short or medium or even long time frame between now and then that does the opposite of lockdown. Um, still getting some of the benefits of lockdown, but does the opposite by opening places up just in a risk managed way. And I think the inc inclusion of testing and Israel have clocked onto this is absolutely critical to avoid exactly that discriminatory thing that you talked to. Thank you. So I want to put the next one to Ian and Tim, if that's all right, and then um, I'll keep moving around. But we've had quite a lot of questions about false positives. Now, I know that in your presentations, you show that the rates can be very low, but in, if you're mass testing millions of people, then clearly that low rate means that we are getting false positives. Someone I was talking to just the other day had a false positive at their school and everyone had to isolate, which presumably if you build that up starts to have an economic cost. Um, so let me put these two to you. So first of all, we've got Catherine da Costa. Households will be using lateral flow tests as kids go back to school next week. Is there an issue with false positives and not being allowed to follow up with a PCR test if it's conducted in school over the next fort fortnight that thousands will have to isolate unnecessarily? And then Robert Cuff, sorry to press on false positives. It looks like the total positive rate in the UK in recent weeks is ballpark one in a thousand. Policy is not to retest, but to isolate for 10 days. Does the PPV support that policy as a proportionate response without retest confirmation? Ian, do you want to start with that? It all depends on the actions you want to take. Let, on schools specifically, um, Tim is leading nationally on, school, on schools testing evaluation. So, so let me take, let, let, let Tim go on the schools and I'll pick up the wider community stuff. Tim. You're muted, Tim. There's very active discussion going on today in the next few days on what to do about um, confirmatory PCRs. And I think actually people are, I mean, Ms. Van said, we don't know everything at this stage, balance of probability. So people are asking for certainty when we don't really know. So the false positive rate, I mean, Michael is saying it's much lower than one in a thousand. It was very low indeed. And I think it is lower than one in a thousand. So in our experience, there aren't that many false positives. We may get, publicity, but they're not very many. Now, precisely how many is unclear. And I, I think if there's an outbreak and you have a positive and you then test your contacts, you will get confirmation that it's positive from your contacts. So if you're a single person in the household and nobody else in the household is positive, you immediately have an anxiety to false positive. But if your sister is positive, well, it's probably true. So I think there's a bit of common sense about what we mean we aren't looking at tests in isolation. The other thing which is a bit odd is this idea you mustn't do a confirmatory PCR. I think 
you can always go and get a test and trace. I mean, people do that. The question is whether you have to or whether you just can do if you want to. And I think there's a, everything's a bit too black and white. And I think we'll find out over the next week or two whether there's a real false positive problem or whether it's just anxiety before it starts. So I would just call it and wait to see what happens rather than being black and white. Before we move off schools, sorry, just before we come back to you, Ian, there's a couple of others on schools, so I thought I might as well just throw them in quickly um, to you, Tim. Ingrid is asking, Ingrid Torgerson is asking if we're testing in schools twice a week is enough, should it be daily? And then another person who's anonymous, I mean, I do think you've addressed some of this, that they're saying that given the Innova tests will probably only catch 50 to 67% of infected people and perhaps much less as they are self-swabbing, how much public health value is really added when we're still battling to ensure universal mask use and good ventilation in classrooms? Does it make sense to pour so much effort into these LFT campaigns? First of all, we're not saying 50 to 60%, we're saying that it picks up 80 to 90% of the infectious people. So that's the wrong number. That's what we've been trying to say all, all seminar. It's not that number, it's a higher number. Secondly, when you pick them up as positive and take them out and put them at home, you're reducing the risk in the school. See, so far, about 40,000 people in the NHS have been identified and are no longer working there for that week, reducing transmission. How often should you do it? Well, you know, you've got to be reasonable and practical. And so once a week is better than once a fortnight and twice a week is better than once a week. I don't think it's practical to do it more than once, twice a week and you get diminishing returns. So the more often you do it the, uh, after twice a week, you get really a very small pickup rate and so it's probably not worth it. So I think, again, I think twice a week is probably the maximum you need for um, active management. And that's not the same as if you know you are in high risk, daily, daily testing, in case you're incubating the disease, it's a rather different setting. Um, Ian, do you want to come back on the rest on that? And, and just also on this point, when people are isolating with a false positive, I absolutely take what Tim's saying, but that is, a big personal and potentially countrywide economic cost. At the moment, I'm very sorry, we are locking down the whole country. The whole country's been locked down on a low, on a huge false positive rate. We are quarantining people by the bucket load, most of whom are not infectious. So the okay. current policy is a huge false positive rate for infectiousness. Okay, good point. Ian? As I said earlier, Anushka, I'm, I'm sitting here surrounded by a population with rocketing unemployment who are currently locked down and harms are being created to everyday lives and the livelihood, particularly the life chances of the children growing up in the pandemic. So this is a really serious public health problem for me as a public health physician, not just virus transmission. So the appliance of a, of a predictive value has to be set in the overall community, social, public health context in which you are applying that. We can theorize till the cows come home about changing prevalence and increasing false positive rates as, as prevalence drops. Yes, it does. But by how much, where, in what context, what action are you going to take? If you're going to rapidly test uh, all of the contacts. So a lot of people just suddenly aren't unnecessarily isolating, then you, you've solved that problem. If you've, you've got test to release, you, you, you've solved that problem. You are agile, you deploy these tools according to the needs of the local community. It's their lives and their livelihoods at stake. So I call for a little respect and the appliance of common sense at a local level, rather than remote theorization and policy making. And, but just on this point, eventually we're not talking about an entire lockdown or um, mass testing. We're, we're talking, aren't we, about the use of mass testing as we emerge from lockdown anyway. So I suppose just with that in mind, one of your colleagues, Irina, um, from UCL, Paula, is asking what the evidence is on how cost effective this is. Are there studies that have been done or is it something that we will have to understand as we start to roll out mass testing more widely? I mean, I don't think there have been any uh, specific uh, cost effectiveness studies done yet, but uh, you can, on the other hand, you can say, okay, what is the cost of a lockdown? What is the alternative uh, to a lockdown? And then if we can, with the mass testing, keep the society open, 
I think it, there would be a huge benefit, not only financial, but also to people. I mean, people like me who have been in my house for nearly a year now, I'm looking forward uh, to get out and about. And I think there are many, many, many people who are longing to get back to some kind of normality. And I think that is what we need to put into the equation as well. Okay, thank you. Eric, there's a question here about the US. Um, saying a national poll by the COVID Collaborative recently released in the US reported the great majority of Americans are willing to report results of antigen death tests voluntarily. However, this has been difficult to do in practice. What are the best practices for reporting rapid antigen test results? And how can this process be improved? What tools could enable this? Yeah, so I think, you know, giving information for people who are testing at home at who to report to and where to report to and when, I think, is a huge aspect of it, but also getting trust in terms of when you're sending the kit itself, making sure that people understand who's sending it and who gets access to those test results. I think, again, there are going to be disparities in the communities that feel comfortable using, you know, mass testing and rapid testing at home, and those who feel like there are concerns about, you know, who's going to get access to that and what that means for their employment and their livelihood. Um, and so I think that it's kind of a partnership in terms of making sure that the public health institutions in each local place that are giving these tests make it very clear what the ways to report it is, what the repercussions of reporting are, in order to make people buy into the system a little bit better. Brilliant. There's a question here from Pete, which I'm going to be honest, I don't totally understand, but I'll ask it and I'm sure you guys will, which is on at-home mass testing, one of the biggest challenges is ensuring people can register their at-home LFD with some form of health status certificate. Would love to hear some thoughts on how that could be done. Who would like to talk to that? Tim? Sorry, I, I missed that. Oh, sorry, don't worry. It, it's, it, in, Pete is well, saying one of the biggest challenges is ensuring people can register their at home. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think this is very, I mean, I think this is a, a really important point. And I think that the, there's been attempts to make software, make it easy for people to do that. And I think they're still being developed, but I think it, we are behind on ease of, of reporting. People are reporting their, um, through test and trace their results, but it's, I think, I'm not very familiar with this, but I think it's a bit clunky, but there are, the test and trace database has got a lot of um, results registered. So some people are doing it, but I think it needs to be developed. I think it's not quite good enough. I, th I think this is a really important issue and there's certainly demand um, in Liverpool. And we've been calling for, the, the rapid deployment of the ability to put your health status information, your vaccination status, your, your, your testing status, make it easy and, and then have it localized. It might be a, a specific video for a specific purpose for testing that enables people to prepare for what to do depending on their test result. If those sort of facilities were available to localize, we could use that repeated testing uh, as a communication channel to reinforce other control measures. So there's a very important psychological principle of situation intention planning. If you can convey as much information to someone about what you might intend to do given a particular situation such as a negative test result, how can you maximize the benefit to the individual, the people they work with and the wider community? We need those communication channels the technology is available now. Um, the bureaucracy has been a bit clunky to get it rolled out. But again, just get it pulled, get prototypes used by uh, local communities and you, you will find this uh, evolves quickly. Thank you. Irene and Michael Hopkins here asking, can we get away from swabs for antigen tests? People don't want to use those frequently. What about saliva instead? My understanding that they are under uh, development and they also develop, they have developed swaps that are far less intrusive that only go up a little bit into your nose. Uh, I know that they are now using them in Denmark. Uh, so I think uh, the technology is uh, under development and we will see a more pleasant uh, test coming into the market. Um, thank you. This is a question that's kind of to you, Ryan, and it's a little bit critical of what you were saying, but it, it's one that can, perhaps others can mention as well. Um, Ari here saying that they didn't like to hear the idea of mass rapid testing as a way to oppose a zero COVID strategy, as if it were 
an extension of the storied British common sense, and then to hear you pivot to a more punitive um, side of compliance with isolation. Um, some of the earlier experts, she, she, she or he, I'm not sure, sorry, say, um, seem to support a zero COVID or at least a zero outbreak strategy. And um, just wondering if any would like to comment further, maybe you first, Ryan, and then maybe I can throw that to some of the others. Yeah, I, th I think that's a, an unfair characterization of our approach, actually, because as we've already heard, lockdown is a blunt tool and the cost of it are huge and untold. We're not just saying there needs to be punitive measures to ensure isolation. We're also saying that any barrier to being able to isolate, which you know I see in my, in my home city of Liverpool, the fear of losing a job or the fear of losing income, that needs to go as well. And you need to introduce measures like we've seen in Finland, where you cover 100% of someone's salary and there's legislation to ensure job security. But the bigger point, this quest for zero COVID, I think it's a challenge because we've got to live alongside this virus as safely and as freely as possible. Lockdown has its place, has its role to play. We probably locked down too late first time around and maybe too late this year. Lockdown is about driving down cases to a manageable number and then introducing the infrastructure to manage that risk and introduce freedoms, not just to go to the pub and go to the cinema, but to get back to education, to get back to work and uplift people's mental health and physical well-being. So I think it's, it's an unfair characterization and it's much more nuanced and textured than that. And actually the aims here is about improving people's experiences alongside trying to manage the, manage the virus. We're almost out of time, but I'd love to hear all of you just comment on this idea of where we're actually heading and whether this can get us to a zero COVID state or whether this is the kind of way that you see us unlocking society to live with this disease. Um, Eric, what about you? So I don't think that we're headed towards a zero COVID state from everything that we know, and I don't think that it's realistic um, to expect us to. I think that um, at a certain point, we have to look at the morbidity and mortality of, uh, you know, of COVID itself and look at the other conditions that we have. We've got diabetes, we've got hypertension, we've got anxiety and depression, and all of these are getting way worse under our current lockdowns, right? Um, people's obesity is getting worse, right? And so at a certain point, we're going to get to this place where we need to address the other health conditions that are going on and not just focus on COVID. And so I think that we will have to decrease the, the rates of transmission as much as we can. So we'll always be social distancing for the foreseeable future. Masks are going to be around for the foreseeable future. But um, I think that the hope is that we will be able to manage this within our public health system. So when hospital systems are about to collapse, we don't have a choice. We have to lock down. But when you're able to tolerate a couple of sick patients, I think as a society, we'll come to the place where recognizing we need to take a holistic approach to overall health and a holistic approach to poverty and illness um, and homelessness, that that's going to be something that we have to address. COVID is novel, and that's why we're focusing on eradicating it. We have lots of problems that people face that aren't novel, that can cause even more morbidity and mortality. I think it's false to only focus on one thing. Thank you. Ian? I don't see our response as unique to SARS-CoV-2. Um, a, a responsible evolved public health system should be able to predict, prevent, prepare for, resist and recover from, with alacrity, a pandemic. I don't see this particular virus, given its, its characteristics, going away very quickly. But all that we are doing has collateral benefits for making a much more agile and joined up health and social care system. And that will make us more prepared for the next pandemic. So I tell you, think about this as a system. Think about this in wider public health terms and not just one destination, such as the zero COVID strategy. Thank you, Tim. And I think the lateral protest is going to make, in the future, make our life a lot better. I think we can live with COVID much more easily. You take control of your illness. You're a responsible person. You don't want to infect others. You're worried for whatever reason having COVID today, feeling ill, being in contact, whatever reason, you take a test, you can know that if you're negative, you're less likely to be positive to be infectious. That is a remarkable way to improve the quality of life. And I think in that sense, for responsible people, it will be very, very popular. Thank you. And Irina, I think this is the last um, 
yeah, we're about to finish, so you can have the final word on this. I am hoping that uh, in a year's time we can meet again and say, do you remember the COVID uh, pandemic? Uh, and we can talk about uh, all our experiences we had. Uh, so I'm hoping that we are getting uh, to that level, that we are no longer talking about a pandemic, uh, but we will see uh, where we are in March uh, 2022. I would like to thank all the speakers uh, today for making a excellent contribution. I would also like to thank all the participants for some very, very good questions uh, and comments. And I hope this is not the end of our discussion, but just the beginning. So thank you very much. And a special thanks to you and Oscar for chairing the meeting. Thank you very much. I've learned a lot and I hope when we meet next year, it'll be in a crowded, sweaty pub um, and we'll all know that we're safe. Thank you everyone for watching. Uh, this has all been recorded, so you will be able to watch it back if you would like to on the UCL website. Have a lovely evening.